Our next speaker came to us from Great Britain. He represents the Cobden Center, British think tank, and he's about to speak about blockchain, new intellectual battleground within economics. His name is Max Langley. If I Rangley, Rangley, right? Rangley, Rangley. You do it. Okay, please welcome him with applause. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so as you said, I run the Cobden Center, which is uh, an Austrian school think tank in the UK, um, actually founded by the only real pure Austrian school member of parliament in the UK. And for the last few years, we've done quite a lot of effort on blockchain technology and really what this means for the future of the Austrian school. So in 2016, uh, we organized the blockchain summit in the European parliament and that was a five day long summit. And we had most of the global institutions there, like the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the BIS, the United Nations, and so on, um, as well as uh, the Bank of England, the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. And we had a series of round table discussions to discuss how this technology might evolve over the next generation and really what it will mean for the world. Uh, and interestingly, all of the main global institutions uh, recognize that this technology is going to have profound effects on the economy, that it's going to be very innovative. Uh, actually, after the event, the, both Europol, who were there, and the OECD kindly wrote papers for the Cobden Centre, going through some of their um, perspectives on this. And interestingly, the OECD talked about how cryptocurrency will be useful in developing countries, where, for instance, there's very high inflation rates because it gives people some, another form of money that they can move into uh, to get out of the government or central bank money. But I think increasingly, uh, as central banks across the West especially begin to implement negative interest rates, uh, this will have a similar impact, and that's one of the things I'll be talking about today. But another thing that, that all of these institutions mentioned in the EU Parliament event, um, the IMF and all of them, is this idea that if private money becomes widely used, then essentially central banks are giving up a lot of their control over the economy. Their ability to, uh, to engage in monetary policy in any traditional sense of the term is really going to be impaired by this technology. Uh, so again, if we look at it from a Hayekian perspective, uh, over the last few decades, many governments, including Britain, have made a series of mostly farcical attempts to run government monopolies, uh, airlines, and many other areas. Uh, very few economists now would advocate this type of economics. And I suspect in another generation or so, people will say the same thing about a government monopoly on money. Uh, but additionally, when when Friedrich von Hayek in the 1970s was writing about this, uh, he, he wrote some papers on uh, the denationalization of money. And around the same time, he won the Nobel Prize in economics, uh, essentially talking about how central banks setting interest rates distorts the economy, as opposed to the more traditional conception that it stimulates the economy. But again, the power of central banks to, man to manipulate interest rates in this way really rests on the power to create money. And that power is now beginning to slip away with private forms of money. But additionally, as this technology has been developing over the last few years, central banks have also been looking at how to absorb this technology. So that's something that I'll come to a bit more deeply in a moment, is what that will mean with central bank issued digital currencies. So what we're moving into now is really the first, the first free market in money of the modern digital age. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with the most famous cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. There's also modern interpretations and more traditional forms of money like digital gold. There's also some completely new innovations. So for instance, Gridcoin comes from the University of California at Berkeley. And if you donate computing power from your personal computer, 
to be used for scientific research in mathematics and physics, you get rewarded a newly created grid coin. Uh, Stanford University did something similar, whereby if you donate the computing power from your home computer that's not being used, you get rewarded in what they have called cure coin, but that computation is used for studying protein folding, which is heavily computationally uh, intensive. But it's used in a lot of modern medicines. So again, it's, it doesn't make sense to think about things in terms of, is there going to be a reserve currency that's going to be a cryptocurrency? Rather, it makes more sense to think of things in terms of, well, the term Fritz Macklup used was moneyness. This idea that in different contexts, uh, different commodities can have different levels of moneyness. The classic example being cigarettes, which are often used as money in prisons and other similar types of areas. But as we move into this world of multiple competing monies, it makes sense to think of it like that. Uh, not so much that is Bitcoin going to replace the current monetary system or something like this, but rather where are these forms of money going to be useful? Now, there's an interesting quote I've put up there from Charles Hoskinson, who's quite an important figure in <coughs> blockchain. And, uh, and he talks about how with blockchain, the money itself is programmable. Uh, so in essence, you could send money to a child to, uh, who's at school uh, and program into the money that that has to be used for buying books or so on, rather than alcohol or cigarettes or whatever you want. But again, in a moment when I come to talking about central banks uh, and their projects to do with digital currencies, it's worth bearing this in mind. That this is really a new form of money. The money itself becomes programmable, and there's a lot that can be done with that. Now, in terms of how this is going to affect the business cycle, again, at the, at the core of the Hayekian thought in this area is the idea that when central banks set interest rates, rather than stimulating the economy, they're actually distorting the economy. In other words, they're sending false price signals to the economy, and especially to credit markets. So just as bureaucratic price setting has failed in other sectors, uh, again, in Britain in the 1970s, it was attempted in many different sectors and, and was, was rather farcical in, in all of these areas. Uh, again, the Austrian school would tend to treat interest rates in the same way. The interest rates should be set by the market rather than by central banks. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the business cycle theory, but it's worth running through just a very brief outline because uh, it touches on how cryptocurrencies will affect us. So again, when, when interest rates are set artificially low, lower than they would be in the free market, uh, more credit is created than is justified by the amount of savings in the economy. So you end up with a mismatch of demand and supply uh, relating to the pool of real savings in the economy. This also leads to a distortion in the time preferences of the economy, uh, as in interest rates really coordinate uh, uh, people's time preferences in terms of whether they prefer to save and spend at a later date or vice versa. And of course, the capital structure of the economy, that is the factories and so on, will also over time mold itself around the false price signals set by artificially low interest rates. And that's one of the things that we've been seeing over the last few years with 0% interest rates. Again, private money creation will allow really a move away from this type of economy in which bubbles are created through artificially low interest rates and to, towards a new type of economy. So if interest rates are then allowed to be set by the demand and supply functions of the free market rather than central banks, then what this will lead to is time preferences becoming re-coordinated. So again, the credit markets can then function as normal as they should do in a free market, just like other pricing mechanisms. Now with the development of blockchain, Money has been the most famous application, with Bitcoin especially, and, and the other types that I talked about a moment ago. But also you'll increasingly see credit markets on the blockchain as well. At the moment you do have peer-to-peer -peer lending, but it's a fairly small and niche area of the economy. With blockchain it can become far more evolved. You can have intermediaries within credit markets and so on. But again, this will still be an area of the economy which will, where the interest rates will be set by the market. Uh, if more people are saving, 
that, incre that increases the pool of savings available. So that brings down the interest rate. Uh, it's, it's the, the, the interest rates are not a function of uh, decision makers at central banks. It's a function of the demand and supply of credit in the economy. But again, this, this harkens back to the point I made earlier. Uh, in the EU Parliament event, this is what the IMF and all of the others brought up, was, was this idea that the monetary policy instruments available to central banks get weaker and weaker in this scenario. They can no longer use 0% interest rates. They can no longer, in many cases, use QE because people will substitute out of this money and into private forms of money and also private credit markets. So from the perspective of Hayek and Mises, again, it's allowing interest rates to be set by the free market that will bring about the economic recovery. So if we look at our current situation, for instance, we've really had, in my view, a bubble that's been building up for the last few decades. So we've had interest rates falling steadily from the 1980s onwards. Again, this, they're not falling as a result of increased savings. This is not a function of the market. This is a function of central banks setting interest rates artificially low. So, for instance, after the recession of the late 80s in America, uh, Greenspan ran very loose monetary policy during the 1990s, which created the dot-com boom. Then when that burst around the year 2000, he went for even more loose monetary policy, all the way down to 1% interest rates, and that then created the housing bubble. When that burst in 2008, we then had even looser monetary policy, years of 0% interest rates and QE, and as we know, in, in many cases, even negative interest rates. And that has now created an even larger bubble. So in, in 2007, there was roughly about $150 trillion of global aggregate debt. Uh, and that was already regarded as a very substantial debt bubble. It was really already the largest debt bubble in human history at that point. That began to burst in 2008, that debt bubble. And since then, we've had a decade of 0% interest rates. And, and that $150 trillion of aggregate global debt has been turned into $250 trillion of global aggregate debt. So again, what we're in the midst of is a classic Austrian school bubble, uh, just with more and more credit being pumped into this bubble with lower and lower interest rates. So when this one bursts, that's been built up by 0% interest rates, the only place they can go from there really is negative interest rates. Uh, the IMF have written some interesting papers on blockchain and uh, actually their, their team were at the, at the EU event, so the, guy, the main guy who wrote this was there at, the, at our round table discussions. One of the things he talked about was this idea that uh, if, if private money becomes more widespread, uh, it it's becomes similar to a gold standard. Uh, as they would see it, it, it can bring about a deflationary spiral, like during the 1930s. Uh, but actually, from an Austrian school perspective, it's more likely to force discipline on central banks because they can no longer use 0% interest rates or QE to, as they would view it, stimulate the economy. But from an Austrian school perspective, of course, they're just distorting the economy even more with these types of policies. And the National Bureau for Economic Research uh, have written similar ideas about how uh, more, more digital currencies would force central banks to pursue tighter monetary policy. And, and the European Central Bank, in one of their interesting papers on cryptocurrencies, talked about how a way of dealing with this might be to try and impose minimum reserve requirements on virtual currency schemes. But again, they're really seeing things in terms of previous years or even previous centuries. This is something out of the world of Walter Badger. If we think about the types of money I was talking about, uh, money that's backed by uh, in donating your computing power to, to be used for scientific research, it makes no sense to talk about this having reserve requirements. Uh, and now uh, central banks are also looking at using blockchain to implement negative interest rates. So I think that's going to really um, take things to another level. The, the chief economist of the Bank of England there, Andrew Haldane, uh, gave a good speech on this. 
And really what this will represent is a complete inversion of the natural laws of economics, negative interest rates. And if it's done with blockchain-based money, with central bank digital currency, it will be programmed into the money itself. So there'll be nowhere to run and nowhere to hide for the saver with all of the added distortions that I spoke about earlier. And so to conclude, I think the Austrian school allows us to understand a lot of the current developments more than other schools. Uh, blockchain is really, I think, in the midst of bringing about a renaissance of the Austrian school. Um, we also did a, a panel discussion last week at the event in Madrid, and that was, not, that was bringing in uh, people from the blockchain world to talk about these ideas. So a lot of people are coming to the Austrian school from the world of crypto and blockchain. Uh, the central bank use of blockchain will really allow hitherto unimagined forms of control, including programming into the money, negative interest rates, and other usage patterns. Uh, so the reliable way to achieve sound money is just like in other areas of the economy, through competition. Thank you very much. Questions, hands up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, great talk. Uh, I'm a bit worried, uh, maybe I'm too pessimistic on this, but um, I think the problem would be that if blockchain or Bitcoin becomes more and more accepted as a medium of exchange, then the government still has the power to shut it down essentially. So they could say, uh, major corporations, you aren't allowed to accept any payments in Bitcoin. And that way, if, uh, for example, you couldn't pay on Amazon or any other big retail store uh, with, the, with your Bitcoins, because uh, they, have their, uh, they are at risk uh, of being punished for it, then uh, the circulation of Bitcoin would be extremely limited in that form and couldn't really pose a danger to the existing monetary system. Yeah. I. I think it's something that's obviously been discussed in many circles is, is banning cryptocurrencies. There was uh, several congressmen in the US that talked about it. But if you read, for instance, the IMF documents or, or um, you know, the round tables that we had in the EU parliament, they were all uh, praising this technology on what it will achieve it's truly revolutionary. It's, it's going to change a lot of different areas of, of the financial sector, especially, but also more than that. So I suspect it, they would be doing too much harm to try and ban it if you look at the amount of innovation um, that's going on at the moment. But of course, we don't know. They may well go down that route. But also, it's worth bearing in mind, it's very difficult to ban. This is not, Bitcoin is not run on a server where you can just shut it down. It's, it's completely distributed. It's, it's more similar to something like Pirate Bay. I mean, they've been trying to shut down Pirate Bay and, and other torrent sites for years with little to no success. And, and this will be similar to that. Yeah, so my question is alluding to the actual implementation of uh, a central bank issued cryptocurrency. So in 2018, the Bank for International Settlements released a report in which they talk about the central bank issued digital currencies. So what do you think, how will this actually be implemented? Because it kind of defeats the purpose of cryptocurrencies, which is getting rid of the middleman. Yeah, that, it's right. Um... The key thing, the key benefit for central banks, again, is this idea that the money itself is programmable. So if you take negative interest rates, obviously most of the major central banks, or a lot of them are talking about negative interest rates right now. There's been papers from the IMF and so on on this area. Uh, but with negative interest rates, the core problem is, if you, ha if you have money in your bank and it was going down steadily due to negative interest rates, well, you just take your money out and keep it in cash. That's the sensible thing to do. So essentially, you're constantly liable to causing bank runs. Whereas if you have a central bank digital currency, if we all have money on a central bank blockchain uh, with cash either banned or made very inconvenient, which is more likely, then uh, that the negative interest rates can then be programmed into the money itself. So it will make holding cash, uh, or holding money on the blockchain uh, Undesirable. You'll just want, people will be more likely to spend it as quickly as possible, which from their perspective, that's what they want, because they view that as, as Keynesian stimulus. Uh, but of course, in the Austrian school, that's not how we view things. But there, there are certain, certainly a lot of benefits to a central bank of having money on the blockchain. 
in terms of how they can manage the economy and, as they would view it, uh, provide stimulus for the economy. All right, that's it for now. Thank you, Max. Thanks.